Today we will talk about pilgrimage as a tradition in the Christian faith, primarily in the Roman Catholic community. And the second forum will deal with pilgrimage in other religious traditions such as Judaism and Islam. Let me tell you how I became interested in this subject. There were two events that occurred on the same day that set me on this path of discovery. First, I was watching a series of lectures on the history of Spain. That day, the professor mentioned the pilgrimage site of Santiago de Compostela and its history. Later that day, I was reading a novel, The End of October by Lawrence Wright. It came out in April and follows the spread of a new deadly pandemic. Sound familiar? Mm. In the novel, an individual leaves Indonesia where the virus originated and travels to Saudi Arabia on pilgrimage. The book spent several chapters dealing with what he did during the Hajj, including the accommodations that were made for the millions of his fellow pilgrims with whom he came into contact. Now, when I was working, one of the areas I was responsible for was our association's meetings, about 70 a year. The largest of these had about 4,800 attendees, nowhere near the two and a half million pilgrims who experienced the 2019 Hajj. So I started thinking about all of the logistical operations associated with that particular pilgrimage and the kinds of problems the organizers had to deal with, even without a pandemic. These two experiences stimulated me to start looking into pilgrimage as a religious tradition, and here we are. I will say at the outset that my research was hampered by not being able to access the seminary's library, so my presentations deal less with the theology of pilgrimage than I had hoped, and more with the stories of some pilgrimage sites. What is a pilgrimage anyway? Merriam-Webster defines pilgrim as one who journeys in foreign lands and one who travels to a shrine or holy place as a devotee. And pilgrimage is defined as a journey of a pilgrim, especially one to a shrine or a sacred place and the course of life on earth. Keep the second one in mind for when we get to pilgrimage in the Buddhist tradition next week. I think many of us would associate pilgrimage with a long, difficult journey, maybe like the road to Santiago de Compostela that I wrote about in the July issue of Inspire. But it doesn't have to be. I think if Carl Bonn were here with us this morning, he would describe his hikes to the cross at Shrinemont as a pilgrimage. In fact, he did use these words with me some years ago. A pilgrimage can be limited visit to one site, such as a shrine or a church, or it could be a journey to multiple connected sites, like the Via del Rosso, which you can follow in person in Jerusalem, or in church on Good Friday with the Stations of the Cross. Why do people go on pilgrimage? I like the explanation by Omid Safi in a foreword to the book Pilgrimage in Islam. There are places, objects, and people where the veils between this world and other worlds become quite thin. For a few breaths, it seems as if lightning flashes and a darkened sky lights up. The boundary between this world and the others is revealed for what it was all along, porous. These people, places, and objects are said to contain baraka, a divine force that is palpable to all those who have hearts. The god of the infinite cosmoses shows up nearby. Bruce Feiler is an American author and television personality who hosted a 2016 PBS series called Sacred Journeys that followed six different pilgrims on their journeys. This is how PBS answered the question, what is a pilgrimage? For as long as humans have walked, they have walked to get closer to their gods. The Greeks made these quests as did the Israelites, the Mayans, and the Chinese. Jesus held these journeys along with the Buddha and the prophet Muhammad. These wanderings have been around forever. Pilgrims made them in the eons before writing was invented. Believers made them in the millennia during which great civilizations were built. Seekers follow them today. PBS posited that six stages characterize every pilgrimage and provided the framework for the series. First, the call. 
the opening clarion of any spiritual journey, often in the form of a feeling or some vague yearning that summons expresses a fundamental human desire. Finding meaning in an overscheduled world somehow requires leaving behind our daily obligations. Sameness is the enemy of spirituality. Second, the separation. Pilgrimage by its very nature undoes certainty. It rejects the safe and unfamiliar. It asserts that one is freer when one frees oneself from the daily obligations of family, work, and community, but also the obligations of science, reason, and technology. Third, the journey. The backbone of a sacred journey is the pain of the journey itself. In India, pilgrims approach the holy sites barefoot. In a rock, they flagellate themselves. In Tibet, the more difficult the trip, the more merit the pilgrim acquires. In almost every place, the travelers develop blisters, hunger, and diarrhea. This personal sacrifice enhances the experience. It also elevates the sense of community one develops along the way. Fourth, the contemplation. Some pilgrimages go the direct route, right to the center of the Holy of Holies, directly to the heart of the matter. Others take a more indirect route, circling around the outside of the sacred place, transforming the physical journey into a spiritual path of contemplation. Fifth, the encounter. After the toil and trouble, after all the sunburn and swelling, after all the anticipation and expectation, comes the approach, the sighting. The encounter is the climax of the journey, the moment when the traveler attempts to slide through a thin membrane in the universe and return to the garden of origin where humans lived in concert with the creator. And finally, the contemplation and return. At the culmination of the journey, the pilgrim returns home only to discover that meaning they sought in the familiar of one's own world. We know that pilgrimages even when they, we are not the ones undertaking them, touch a deep chord within us. Else why else would there be a literary and artistic tradition surrounding pilgrimages, both physical and theological? Few students get through high school without some exposure to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales or John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, which has never been out of print since its publication in 1678. And do you know C.S. Lewis's 1933 novel, The Pilgrim's Regress, which he described as a kind of Bunyan up-to-date, recast uh -huh. so that the character struggles with the modern phoniness, hypocrisy, and intellectual vacancy of the Christian church, communism, fascism, and various philosophical and artistic movements. Some pilgrimage, huh? And I think some of us at least saw the 2010 film, The Way with Martin Sheen, which honors the Camino de Santiago and promotes the traditional pilgrimage. Michael Wolff has published essays in a book, 1,000 Roads to Mecca, that collects the writings of more than a score of pilgrims, including the American Malcolm X, who visited Mecca twice in his last months. Enough introduction. Let's get to some of the famous and not so famous pilgrimages in Christendom. The Christian religion has never required pilgrimage as a core doctrine, although in earlier times, sinners may have been directed to make a pilgrimage to a certain holy site as a penance for their transgressions. But the very human desire to become closer to one's God has led many to believe that such closeness can be better achieved at a place that is more holy and sacred than one's own home or even one's own church. The early church contributed to this understanding by promoting miraculous events that, that occurred in their environs, by trumpeting the presence of relics such as a sliver of the true cross or a saint's body part, and by issuing indulgences to pilgrims making those journeys. An egregious example of this last point was the Pope's declaration that crusaders would have their sins remitted in exchange for their campaigns or pilgrimages to free the Holy Land from infidels. Christian pilgrimage was first made to sites connected with the birth, life, ministry, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus. 
aside from the early example of origin in the th third century, surviving descriptions of Christian pilgrimages to the Holy Land date from the fourth century when pilgrimage was encouraged by church fathers, including St. Jerome and established by St. Helena, the mother of Constantine the Great. The purpose of the Christian pilgrimage has been described by Pope De Benedict XVI this way. To go on pilgrimage is not simply to visit a place to admire its treasures of nature, art, or history. To go on pilgrimage really means to step out of ourselves in order to encounter God where he has revealed himself, where his grace has shown with particular splendor and produced rich fruits of conversion and holiness among those who believe. A forum on Christian pilgrimage has a wealth of sites to choose from. Wikipedia lists 30 in the Holy Land alone and more than 150 elsewhere. And that doesn't count the 52 sites holy to Eastern Christianity. Pilgrimage sites range from the obvious like Jerusalem to the famous like Canterbury Cathedral to the more obscure like India's St. Thomas Mount in Chennai where St. Thomas is believed to have been martyred. I'm going to skip over the best known sites of Christian pilgrimage such as Jerusalem and places in the Holy Land associated with Christ's life. Likewise, I'm ignoring the places where Paul and other early apostles spread the gospel. Although some of you might share stories of your own pilgrimages to such places. Instead, I'm going to tell the stories of two sites of Christian pilgrimage centered on visions of the Virgin Mary rather than on Christ. These are both places I have visited, one as a teenager and the other during a period when I was unchurched. So in both cases, I would describe myself as a tourist rather than a pilgrim. But I think these sites have interesting stories that can serve as examples of how a place can become a pilgrimage site. Let me start with Lourdes in South Central France in the foothills of the Pyrenees. This pilgrimage site is often visited by persons seeking healing of physical infirmities rather than merely spiritual solace. Many of you may be familiar with the story through the 1943 movie, Song of Bernadette, starring Jennifer Jones, just one of more than a dozen films made about Bernadette and her experiences. Up until 1858, Lourdes was a modest town of about 4,000 inhabitants with a Masabia grotto on common land used by the villagers variously for pasturing animals, collecting firewood, and as a garbage dump. It ha had a reputation for being an unpleasant place. On the evening of February 11th, 1858, a beautiful but unidentified lady standing next to a rose bush appeared to 14-year-old Bernadette Subaru as she went to gather firewood in the grotto. The lady asked Bernadette to return to the grotto and appeared several more times, variously reported as seven to 18. Bernadette first reported her vision to her skeptical parish priest who involved his equally skeptical bishop. During the decades before Bernadette's visions, several children in small Pyrenean villages in France and Spain had claimed to see apparitions of the Virgin Mary in remote locations. So the clerics initially thought that Bernadette was making a bid for attention. However, they became convinced of the veracity of Bernadette's visions because the lady identified herself as the Immaculate Conception. This was a reference to the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, which had been defined only four years earlier by Pope Pius IX, stating that the Virgin Mary herself had been conceived without sin. It was thought that Bernadette could not have had personal knowledge of this doctrine. During subsequent apparitions, Bernadette prayed the rosary, which Pope John Paul II has said is a power prayer of great significance designed to bring forth, forth a harvest of holiness. The lady also told Bernadette to dig in the ground in a certain spot and to drink from the small spring of water that began to bubble up. Almost immediately, cures were reported from drinking the water, although repeated testing has shown that the water does not have any special curative properties. The figure always appeared in one place, a niche above the main 
cavity of the grotto in which a wild rose bush was growing. Among the instructions from the Virgin were, go and drink from the spring, go and tell the priests to build a chapel here, and have the people come here in procession. These three instructions in particular were to prove pivotal, pivotal in the development of this pilgrimage site and its practices. <clears throat> the local church brought the grotto and surrounding lands in 1861 and immediately started modifying the land to make it more accessible to visitors and to build a church. Three years later, sculptor Joseph Hugh Fabiche was commissioned to create a statue of Our Lady of Lourdes. Although it has become an iconic symbol of the site, it depicts a figure older and taller than Bernadette's description, but more in keeping with orthodox and traditional representations of the Virgin Mary. Over the years, the sanctuary of Our Lady of Lourdes, or the domain as it is known, has grown to 22 separate churches and a hospital and employs 30 full-time chaplains from dioceses and religious communities worldwide. There are nearly 300 full-time lay employees and a further 120 seasonal workers. There are fountains for drinking and pools for bathing in the healing waters. The domain is open year round, but with reduced devotional activity in the winter. The pilgrimage season basically runs between Easter and All Saints Day and has a daily program that includes masses, the sacrament of reconciliation, the five o'clock procession of the, pro of the blessed sacrament and the nine o'clock torch like Marian procession. The domain burns 800 tons of wax devotional candles each year. Today, thousands of ga gallons of water gush from the source of the spring and pilgrims are able to bathe in it. Countless miracle cures have been reported there from the healing of nervous disorders and cancers to cases of paralysis and blindness. The Roman Catholic Church has officially recognized 70 healings as miraculous, the most recent in 2018. Cures are examined using church criteria for authenticity and authentic miracle healing with no physical or psychological basis other than the healing power of the water. Today, Lourdes has a population of around 15,000, but it is able to take in some 5 million pilgrims and tourists from all over the world every season. With about 270 hotels, Lourdes has the second greatest number of hotels per square kilometer in France after Paris. The 150th Jubilee of the first apparition took place on 11 February 2008 with an outdoor mass attended by 45,000 pilgrims. Lourdes has been called the Disneyland of the Catholic Church. Critics argue that the Lourdes phenomenon is nothing more than a significant money spinner for the town and the region, which has a strong vested interest in keeping the pilgrims coming. The church, however, distances itself from commercialization. The many trinket stalls are privately owned and hawkers are strictly forbidden inside the sanctuary. And Bernadette, she joined the Sisters of Charity and did not return to Lourdes for the consecration of the cathedral. Of her life, she said, the Virgin used me as a broom to remove the dust. When the work is done, the broom is put behind the door again. She died at the age of 35 of tuberculosis. Her body has been exhumed three times, most recently in 1925 to secure relics. She was beatified in that year and canonized in 1933. Even those who believe that Lourdes might provide a miraculous cure for their illness can find the financial and physical cost of travel to France beyond them. There are a number of mini Lourdes sites around the world, including the oldest, the National Shrine Grotto of Our Lady of Lourdes at Saint Mary, Mount St. Mary's, about 100 miles from us in Maryland. That grotto was first established in the mountains in 1805 by the university's founder, who was attracted to a light on the mountain and found a blessed spot at the foot of a large oak tree. Note, this is half a century before Bernadette's apparitions. It was just considered a place for prayer and contemplation. 
Over time, pathways were established and crosses attached to trees for the stations of the cross, and efforts were made to make the site more like Lourdes. St. Elizabeth Ann Seton frequented the grotto. In the mid 20th century, the grotto was refurbished, made more accessible to the public, and proclaimed public oratory. It includes a stone excavated from the original grotto to spiritually connect the two places. It hosts thousands of visitors each year. Not all pilgrimage sites are in Western Europe like Lourdes and Santiago de Compostela. Let's move now to the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe, a Roman Catholic church, basilica, and national shrine in the northern part of Mexico City. The basilica I visited was built in 1709, but the land on it was sinking. A new basilica that can seat 10,000 people was opened in 1974. There are several related churches and buildings as part of the complex. The shrine is visited by some 20 million people annually throughout the year, but especially around December 12, Our Lady of Guadalupe's feast day. Observances to Mary have occurred at this site since the 1530s. How did this come about? In December 1531, St. Juan Diego, you can see it, who for obvious reasons I will refer to as Juan Diego, experienced visions of the Virgin Mary on five occasions. Juan Diego and his wife, Maria Lucia, who was deceased at the time of the apparitions, were among the first indigenous people to be baptized after the arrival of the main group of 12 Franciscan friars in 1524. He was neither rich nor influential, but stories about him characterized him as fervently religious, artless, respectful, and devoted to a sick uncle. Juan Diego regularly walked from his home to the Franciscan mission a station for religious instruction and to perform his religious duties. On December 9, 1531, while on his usual journey, he encountered the Virgin Mary, who instructed him to request the bishop to erect a chapel in her honor. He delivered the request and the bishop instructed him to come back another day after he had had time to reflect on this. On the way home, Juan Diego again encountered the Virgin and announced his failure. He suggested the failure was due to his being a man of no importance and urged her to recruit someone of greater standing. She told him to repeat the request to the bishop. The bishop was more compliant the next day, but asked for a sign that the apparition was truly from heaven. Juan Diego communicated this request in the apparition, in, in the next apparition, and was told she would provide a sign the next day. However, Juan Diego's uncle had fallen sick and Juan Diego stayed home to attend him, missing his appointment with the Virgin. On the next day, he went to get a priest to attend his uncle's deathbed, but because he was embarrassed about failing to meet the Virgin the previous day, he took a different route to the mission station. The Virgin appeared on this new route and chided him for not appealing to her for help, using the most famous phrase of the Guadalupe event, one that is inscribed over the main entrance today. No estoy yo aquí, que soy tu madre. Am I not here, I who am your mother? She told him to climb a hill where he gathered an abundance of flowers unseasonably in bloom. On gaining admission to the bishop later that day, Juan Diego opened his mantle, the flowers poured to the floor, and the bishop saw that they left on the mantle, the imprint of the Virgin's image, which he immediately venerated. The last apparition occurred not to, San Juan, or not to Juan Diego, but to his uncle, who said that the Virgin appeared to him at his bedside, where he fully recovered. She told him she desired to be known under the title Guadalupe. The bishop kept the mantle on public display where it gathered great attention and on December 26, a procession was organized to take it back to Juan Diego's hometown to a hastily elected chapel. In the course of the procession, the first miracle was allegedly performed when an Indian was mortally wounded by an arrow shot accidentally. 
In great distress, the Indians carried him before the Virgin's image and pleaded for his life. The arrow was withdrawn and he made a complete recovery. Was Juan Diego immediately proclaimed a saint? Not exactly. Although the Guadalupe cult of devotion to Mary gained official sanction in a process that took from 1663 to 1754, the modern movement for canonization of Juan Diego himself began only in 1974 during celebrations marking the 500th anniversary of his birth. The diocesan inquiry concluded in 1986, opening the Vatican stage of the canonization process. The process of beatification was completed in a ceremony presided over by Pope John Paul II at the Basilica in 1990. In May 1990, a miracle was duly ascribed to him. The march toward canonization then became delayed. I am not expert on the Byzantine ecclesiastical policies and politics which occurred during the process of an examination for canonization. Mm -hmm. Suffice it to say that an intervention occurred, calling into question the historicity of Juan Diego and his apparitions. The accounts of Juan Diego and his apparitions appear in the works of an Indian scholar who was a contemporary of Juan Diego and in other publications in both Spanish and, in indi and indigenous languages from the 1640s on, these latter are a century away from the events they are reporting on. And other sources, which might have been expected to comment on the events, are silent, leading to vigorous scholarly debate throughout the 1990s. Leaving aside any question as to the reality of the supernatural events as such, the primary doubts about the historicity of Juan Diego and the Guadalupe events arise from the silence of major sources that would have been expected to mention him, including the bishop and the earliest ecclesiastical historians who reported on the spread of the Catholic faith among the Indians. Despite the near contemporary references to a Marian cult attached to a miraculous image of the Virgin, the silence of core 16th century sources remains perplexing. Eventually, Juan Diego was canonized in 2002, based, some observers believe, on the role of Juan Diego in representing and confirming the human dignity of indigenous Indian populations and their claim to a place of honor in New World Catholicism. So these are the stories of two famous Christian pilgrimage sites. I am hoping that you will now share your own experiences as a pilgrim and whether you indeed find the veil between this world and the other to be thin during these experiences. Wow, that's incredible, Kat, as always. Thank you. Yeah. So Betsy's got her hand up. Oh, that was a clap. <laughs> oh, that was a clap. Yay. <laughs> then us <I was> clap. <laughs> well, Betsy's been on pilgrimages. Maybe uh, she'd like to talk about hers. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I mean, each of the trips that we have been, that I've taken have been called, you know, a pilgrimage. But I guess, you know, the one that certainly comes to mind is in Jerusalem. And, you know, following... And this, you know, this is a very short, short one, but following uh, the path, um, you know, on uh, Palm Sunday. And uh, then also, you know, following the Stations of the Cross. And um, I mean, you can tell now, it even just brings tears. There's no question in my mind that you know, the meaning of it is just so heartfelt uh, to feel you're actually there and recounting story that we've heard so many times. So the physical place has a significance. Yes, yes, definitely. Pam, is your hand up? Ooh. Pam? Glim, Glim, your mate. 
You're, you guys are muted. Hello? Is your hand Hello? up? Hello? Um, it wasn't, but um, since you asked, I'll say something. <laughs> um, like Betsy, um, uh, in the 1980s when I was baptized also as an adult, um, one of the ladies from church invited me to go with her on this um, tour of Israel, Jordan, and Egypt. And that was my experience, like you said, Betsy, that you just start crying. Even though our tour guide, I think, was a, la it was a Jewish lady, but um, everybody was crying on the tour. It's just so amazing being there on the Via Dolorosa. But what, what, what I wanted to say is that, um, uh, as you, uh, I think you know, my, Clem and I were, were, were born and raised Catholic, and um, my parents, when they used to visit us in Washington from upstate New York, would drive by the Elizabeth Ann Seton um, uh, grotto that you talked about, Kat. Ha have any of you been there? Yes. Isn't it amazing, um, Pastor and Linda? Um, uh, do you remember the part where when you're walking up the hill at the end, it looks like you're going into the gate of heaven? I remember that so vividly because uh, we went there with my parents and also our dearest friends we've known for 45 years. Uh, we went with them when Elizabeth Seaton was canonized mm -hmm. and um, uh, Clem's mother was alive then. She used to live with us. So it's just wonderful memories. But what my, my dream come true would be that all of us could be at Shrine Mont next last weekend of June in 2021. <laughs> I'm hoping for that happens because isn't it special to go on these retreats? It's just like a slice of heaven, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. Thank you for listening. <laughs> B wants in and then Susan and then Linda and then Maureen. I passed a pilgrimage spot when I was a tourist and went to the Fatima. Is that how you pronounce it? This is what I got from there. The Lady of Fatima, ah. and um, one of the things to me, just like uh, was mentioned just a minute ago, just being there with all these other pilgrims and knowing, feeling the deep, deep transformation, you could see it in their bodies, in their mind, made you feel like you were in a real spiritual place. Yeah. I bet. Susan, did you want in? I, I wanted to ask, um, where is Fatima? I'm not sure anymore. I went some it's, years ago. It's in Portugal. Yeah, that's where I went. I was, wasn't sure it was Fatima or Lourdes, but I was on a trip to Portugal, so that's where I went. Yeah, it, and the, you stand to one side, and there are all these people who are cr crippled, crawling along, or on their knees on the hard pavement, moving toward the shrine. It was just mind-blowing. Linda was next. Um, I went to Elizabeth Ann Seton's place in Maryland, and um, I had just come back to church and just gone into the Catholic church, and was teaching religious ed, and they had a rock there that she had taught religious ed on that she'd actually sat on. And you could sit on it. And there was just, I still remember that as being such a wow experience. Wow. So Maureen? A couple of things. I've, I've been to Mount St. Mary's. And I, unfortunately, I didn't have the same experience that Pam had. Because all I could remember about the trip was all of these people walking back with plastic gallon jugs full of water. Yeah. And it's sort of, I mean, they didn't even stop to kind of focus and think about why they were there. They went, got their water and left. So it just, um, pro it wasn't, the thing that meant the most to me was when I was in Rome and they took us to a place that was purportedly where, gonna get the apostles wrong, but some of the apostles were held in prison, you know, and it was just this little kind of on a door and that was it for, for light. And there was, it was so simple and it didn't have all the other surrounding stuff 
for me to take away um, the, the symbolism of it or the religiousness of it. And, um, and I had a friend that went to Medjugorje, but you don't hear much about Medjugorje anymore. Do you, Kat? Is it still? I know. I'm not familiar with that one at all, Maureen. I think it was in um, near Sarajevo, up in that part of the world, and you kind of oh. lost, um, stopped hearing about it when that part of the world blew up. But it really and it got dangerous to go, yeah. Yeah. Oh, how about you, Gay and Lou? Were you wanting in? No. So I, I, I've been to several uh, pilgrimage sites, but the thing that I wanted to say was many people have, who have been on pilgrimage come back and tell me about their experience, particularly when they had their mind blown, and often they do. And many of them say these words that you said, Kat. They say, it was a thin place. And some of them have read that concept, you know, that sort of Ionian concept, but others didn't even know, didn't he remember hearing it from anybody and still said it was a thin place or they described it in such a way that it sounded, oh, they don't know the word, but it's a thin place you know, where you kind of see through whatever the reality really is into something else. You mean, how do you mean thin? Thin, like as in the, when we look around and we see the world as we see it usually, it looks different. It, it, we feel that something else is there. We feel another reality, a spiritual reality. Oh, oh okay. Or they feel incredibly would... connected to other people. Kat, do you know what the miracle was that occurred in is reported in 2018? Uh, no, I don't. We'll have to look it up. Luckily, there's the World Wide Web. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know why? Because Martha Swearingen is in heaven. And, she, and as her kids testified, she before the World Wide Web, there was mother. <laughs> she knew these things. Yeah. But the rest of us mortals, no. -uh. Oh, she knew where to look for things. <laughs> Important. Anybody else? Yes, Judy? I'd like to say something. Um, <clears throat> two places that, that I went to that I felt that, I don't know if I'd call it a thin place, but it was very moving to me, was Gettysburg. Mm. And it was um, not even a planned stop, but we were close by, and it was a real dreary day. And I felt very moved. I really felt the presence Mm -hmm. of yeah. I don't know if it was the men that died there or what it was but it was it was very emotional and the other place which is sort of unusual it's not a Christian site but was the first trip that I took to Guatemala I went to uh, Tikal which is uh, mm -hmm. a very large ceremonial site at the pyramids and I and I felt it there mm -hmm. um and, and it was like, again, a connection um, mm -hmm. that it's hard to describe. But the, the last place um, was when I went to Assisi, and we went into the huge church there. And within the huge church is, is St. Francis's original little chapel. But then we were led on a tour that took us to his actual cell. Um, where he spent his time, and there was a woman there that was berating all of us for being there, like it was his personal space and we shouldn't be there. Um, but there was a statue of St. Francis, and he had his hands like this, and a live dove was sitting in his hands. And at first I thought it was one of these animatronic things that you see at yeah. Disney World. And then it blinked and it was like, oh my oh. gosh. And it was so cool, but I felt, I felt there uh, a presence also. Not the big church, not the little chapel, but in his actual cell. And I wasn't, these were all things that I wasn't expecting to happen that just did happen. Hmm. Judy, it's good to see you. Oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> Literally. 
How about you, Amanda? Did you want us to get in here? Yes, I I have an idea about some things. I've, I've never been on pilgrimage, but I've had experiences. And I know that other people have had the same experiences. So I wanna say that when you talk about this thinness or this, um, this specialness, this otherness of certain things. For example, in museums or in places, they make them make they make them special. And so many people come because they are special. Michelangelo's David in Florence, um, mm -hmm. King Tut's Death Mask, uh, those you know, the, the, uh, the birth of Venus. You can name any number of things that thousands and tens of thousands of people who thought are more special than other things and say something to them through the ages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Sometimes people say that about churches, that so many thousands of people have, have prayed there through the years that you feel a special holiness in that site. Yeah. No shame was certainly one of those for me, and I'm sure it is for others who've been there. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, the, go ahead, Kat. One of the things that I had, um, when I started on this, that I really had wanted to get into, but could not find resources, it's the kind of thing you need a seminary library for, mm -hmm. was that uh, in England, during the Protestant Reformation there, when the monasteries were dissolved, one of the um, other things that happened at that time was that pilgrimages were outlawed or banned. Mm. And I was curious as to what effect that had and how that influenced or maybe changed in Anglican theology over the centuries. But um, I just put that out there and maybe a year from now when I can get back into different kinds of libraries, we could do another session yeah. on that kind of pilgrimage mm -hmm. you're, but, but you're I, on. I wanted to try to get particularly to the anglican tradition and could not oh. did you see the picture in the paper of the very few people you know in mecca this year yes yeah. actually i just incorporated that into next week's um yeah. uh, presentation i know a woman who um told her priest that she was walking down the street in Fredericksburg and heard a lot of people screaming. And she looked around and there wasn't anybody nearby. Oh, wow. It really rattled her because mm. nobody else heard this except she. Mm. And she actually had tests done. You know, was she having a stroke? Blah, 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 blah. Come to find out, it was she was walking by with the old slave auction block. In, oh, my gosh. In Fredericksburg. And it so changed her, it blew her mind. She was a, a Microsoft engineer and it so blew her mind. She's not a priest, you know, because she knows what she heard. Wow. And I don't, you know, how is that possible? But she did and didn't even know it, you know. And so we trip on these by accident and sometimes we seek them intentionally by going on pilgrimage. One of the um, th things that I read uh, was somebody who was being critical about the miracle phenomenon or the apparition phenomenon, whatever you want to call it. And uh, the response was, um, you know, Christianity is founded on the incarnation and the resurrection. So why wouldn't Christians believe in miracles? Yeah. Absolutely. My daughter feels like Judy when she goes to Gettysburg. She mm -hmm. feels this emotional things, really deep, and she um, she doesn't like being close to it a lot. Mm -hmm. She really felt it when she was there. I, I you know, another thing. Go oh, ahead, Pam. Okay. Um, another time when I think we all get this feeling is when, like, don't we get this feeling when we're together on the Zoom and also when we're in person at church? Um, when I watch the uh, services on the lawn, the recent ones, that feeling is there, like being with uh, quote-unquote holy people. Um, I don't know if any of you um, remember Maddie Stepanek, the 13-year-old boy who wrote poems and essays 
um, about peace, and he died at 13, and his funeral was at a, a church in Montgomery County. Um, I, I attended his funeral, and on the way, um, my car on 495, the Beltway got a flat tire. <laughs> As if got, you know, this, uh, the devil was trying to prevent me to make it, but AAA came, and I went. And there was Jimmy Carter, and there was Oprah, and a whole slew of people, the fire department playing uh, um, Amazing Grace. But I remember feeling that it's like you're entering the word, the world of charity, the world of, of love and heavenly world, being there with all those people. And there was a, um, uh, a nun, all dressed in white, who came up to me. And she said, will you give this rosary I have to the mother of Maddie? <laughs> I don't know why she didn't want to give it herself. But the whole experience, um, uh, I just think it's not only the, the places, but the gatherings of people that give you this amazing retreat feeling. Um, so God is great, and uh, it's, it's really a blessing to have that. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs> So the 2018 miracle, I didn't read, I just scanned briefly, was uh, uh, for a nun who visited Lourdes in 2008, and she was in a wheelchair and recounted that once she got, I think it was once she got back home, she heard, you know, stand up, get out of your wheelchair. And she got out of the wheelchair, wow. got rid of her braces, got rid of wow. all the patient. And so, I, I, as I said, I didn't read far enough, but there's a video, so it would be interesting to go back oh. and look at it, because I assume it's she talking, but I also, she was 79, so I assume it takes all that time for them to really research it, to be able to say it is really uh, a true miracle, because it was proclaimed by the bishop of whoever. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I, I would like to just share with you that in the summer of 64, I participated in that, in that experience and I went to a little place outside Hattiesburg called Petal, Mississippi. Jesus. And um, I stayed with a black family and for about three weeks, I just did help out things that I, I mean, I was there because I wanted to be there and I, I didn't have a whole lot to offer. I did whatever I could. But I remember one of the most memorable experiences was going to what I would call a genuine, <laughs> genuine Black Baptist church. Wow. And um, I mean, this is, you know, in this little town of nowhere. And um, listening to the pastor sing, um, Oh my da 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 What is that song? I can't think. It's one of the famous um, spirituals in black, that that are sung. Anyway, it it was it. I think it had that feeling of a pilgrimage. I was just in awe. I mean, that these people survived, and you know in a way where they felt their spiritual life. It was just amazing to me. Wow. Mari? Um, speaking of church services, a number of years ago, um, a coworker's husband died. and She's African American and Fred and I went to her husband's funeral and talk about an out of place feeling, Fred and I walked into this absolutely packed church and we were the only two white people in the church. And I thought, well, I, it, it's, just, it's not an experience I've ever had before. And I mean, everybody was very gracious and um, um, Bernice's husband was a Capitol Hill police officer and there was a a changing of the kind of the guard at the casket as we came in. So we had to, to wait, but we went up and talked to Bernice a little bit that it was just, I don't know how to explain it, but it was just sort of like, my first thought was, 
where are the rest of our coworkers? And, um, you know, it was just a, a very beautiful event. Connection yeah. moment. Yeah. Yeah. I have to report a little story I know about our friend who was white. And some years ago, he and his wife went to a black church because they wanted to experience. They had never gone before. And this was in the South. So um, this was some years ago. And he went to the church. And when he came out, the police came up to him and said, you'd better get out of town tonight. Oh, wow. <coughs> So, you well, know, well, go ahead, Kat. I was going to say, even though I've been to both uh, Lourdes and, and Guadalupe, um, at that time in my life, I was not looking for those thin experiences. Uh, I was looking for such an experience when I went to Israel, and I did not find it in Jerusalem. Uh, I, I just, <clears throat> where I found it was at the Sea of Galilee, mm -hmm. ah. where things were quiet and peaceful. And I could imagine um, Christ walking along the shore there. That's exactly what happened to me. Hmm. Same place. And I agree about, about Jerusalem. It's just a big city. It's hard to... I want to thank you again, Kat, and give you a plug for next week, because next week is part two. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Kat. Next thank week you. is uh, Judaism, the Hajj, uh, Buddhism. And uh, one that you probably have not heard of before, and I'm not going to spoil it by telling you today. Uh, 